conflict. And yes, yeah, so I have three people with me today. So the first speaker is going to be Gerardo Torres Contreras, who is a research fellow in energy justice and transitions in the science policy and research unit in the University of Sussex. Then we're going to hear uh, Cristobal Bonelli, who is the University of Amsterdam. And then we're going to hear uh, Maria Montesino, uh, who is in the um, University of um, Basque, Country. Uh, Basque Country. Yes. And um, yeah, so without further ado, I give. Can I my yes, I will do that right now. <laughs> so I, I will do the same thing as before. So you have 15 minutes. And when you are on the 10 minutes, I will just show you the sign and yeah, and wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, folks. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Gerardo. I'm a research fellow in energy justice and transitions in the science and policy research unit school at uh, University of Sussex. I was asked last Friday to fill out this, this, uh, this spot here, so apologies for the rough presentation on the scattered ideas. I'll be talking about uh, emancipatory politics for relief efforts in the Isthmus of the Wantatec, and basically the the story is that when I started my PhD, this massive earthquake struck the south of Mexico. Um, I saw this, this disaster as a rupture that allowed us to see on the one hand, you would see disaster capitalism, this classic disaster capitalism in, 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 in misplaced terms, but also these alternatives coming from the bottom. And one of these projects it was about territorial defense, uh, territorial defense against green extractivism, against wind energy, so I don't get it. Can I next slide, please? <laughs> in September uh, 7, 20, 2017, the strongest earthquake in the last 100 years shook southern Mexico, right? It was around 7.6. I don't, not sure whether we account for earthquakes anymore, the magnitude, but it was around 7.6. And then a second earthquake, 15 days later, struck the same region again. This region has been key for wind energy development in Latin America. It has the biggest concentration, the biggest concentration of wind turbines in Latin America and in Mexico. And it is also the narrowest part in Mexico between oceans. The Isthmus of the one effect has always been an extractive paradise for the Mexican government. It started with a trans Isthmian railway in early 1900. Then it went to oil extraction. Um, now it's wind energy. And now the, the new president has this idea about connecting the two oceans with a train railway. Next slide, please. This is a map. Um, you can see the narrow part of the oceans, and growth can come in different ways and in different facets and in multiple ways. In this region, it has come in the, in the, in the shape of wind turbines, but also there, there are many mining concessions in this area. Mm -hmm. And also, I just wanted to, to elaborate a few, a few moments on the land situation here, right? We have an ejido, which is land that was distributed after the Mexican Revolution of 1910. But also we have this really weird area called Huchitana Gavayan Nucleus, where different presidential decrees in the 1960s implemented different land tenure regimes. So one president once said it will be collective land, it will be a hero. Next president came to the to the region and said it would be private land. So some people argue that it should be collected. Some people argue that it should be private. And wind energy came in the early 90s and started to develop in this really contested area, land where there are plenty of land politics. So you can imagine the mess that it has created, the green grabbing that it has facilitated. Next slide, please. So as you can see, um, wind energy politics are quite contested. I don't think I need to translate what this means, right? Neocolonialism and how wind energy companies, mainly from Europe, Spain, Denmark, have come to the region and have uh, taken this land. Of course, there is local capture of these, of these rents, 
potentials for a broader contestation of politics about land and who owns the land on what kind of authority should govern on side please. These are different cities key for uh, wind energy development. And you can see that the percentage of dwellings affected by the by the training, by the season events, was about 70% in each town. So as you can imagine, the earthquake created a really fertile ground for wind companies. The next day after the earthquake, wind companies lent machinery to communities to bring up rubble and debris from the street. Of course, communities were late, were, were charged for this machinery late later in the in the wind energy contracts in the wind events. But the image that wind companies were helping with fossil efforts was better. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, you can see the the degree of destruction and damage created by the earthquake. Next slide. Um, so basically, people, although although their dwellings were like this, people didn't want to leave their, their homes or the piece of land because they said, if we live now, wind energy companies will come and they will install a wind turbine here now. So we better stay here, we better camp on the road than to leave our piece of land because they will come and they will take it from us. Next slide, please. So yeah. My, my take is that a disaster is a rupture, right? There is a context of vulnerability, emergency, and unrest brought about by the end case of modified wind energy expansion in the region. This moment of rupture, of course, was used in the interest of different actors, according, in my opinion, to the, to the, to the position they have vis a vis wind energy policies. For the local and federal governments, disasters were a tool to advance a territorial rearrangement for the next wave of wind energy farms coming to the region. And for agrarian movements, it was an opportunity to articulate practices of territorial defense and of the economy and the resulting Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Forbes magazine says every disaster is an opportunity to be more see. So disasters are messy and heterogeneous spaces in which different interests are played. We have this classic now on the claims, disaster capitalism, defined as a process whereby national and transnational government, governmental institutions, use a catastrophe to promote and empower private, neoliberal, and capitalist interests for accumulation and profit. On the other hand, we have this a concept coined by Rebecca Solni, disaster collectivism, and a sense, it is a sense of immersion in the moment and how a disaster can create solidarity with others because of the rupture of everyday life. Right? So these vulnerabilities were mediated through the earthquake. And this is a key moment to understand who is in power in the region, who is cast aside, what is prioritized in the revision processes, and who is targeted by such efforts. In the region, none of the wind turbines collapsed or were damaged, but above 80% of the dwellings collapsed. So you can imagine the vulnerability that the next slide. This is a picture uh, by a wind energy company, and you can see the logic behind it. So there is kind of a savior providing a um, emergency package to, to a local community. Next slide, please. Then this is the effort from the Indigenous Assembly. And you can see that uh, the image is completely different. Right? Um, first of all, only on women, and also the spirit in which they pose for the picture. And this is where my role as a researcher came in. I went to the region and I was invited by the Indigenous Assembly collaborate on this project called Transmitting the Heart of the Indigenous of the Wonderful. The goal was to rebuild kitchens, kitchens collectively to boost Totopo. Totopo is uh, basically a form of tortilla produced in Mexico um, for the commercialization and economic and, and 
internationalization of the economic and social activities around this basic uh, project. The aim of the project was to enhance collect resistance processes against extractive projects in community sourcing new projects and selected to source new energy projects in the future. Basically, the project in the MS Assembly was trying to activate resistance cells in the future that will work as new energy and these extractive companies come to the region. And a really important dimension was to repair social divisions for by extractive projects. This community that were heavily affected by women in the farms in 20, in 2005, 2010, had really, really strong social divisions. So through corn production through maize, the Indian Assembly wanted to reboot, reboot solidarity networks as well as these really social divided groups. That's fine. Please, thank you. So yeah, this is this is a, a workshop that the Indian Assembly uh, led. This is in a really symbolic town called San Dionisio del Mar. San Dionisio del Mar led the resistance against the largest wind farm in Latin America called um, Marena Renovable. The project was canceled and later was moved just to a neighboring town. But you can imagine the not only the, the divisions caused, but also the politics within the community because of this structure project. Next, next slide, please. The rules of operation for the project were basically that project beneficiaries were going to be women and families without help from the government or the third party, right? And the members would oversee the reconstruction of the kitchens and would be based on techo. Techo is collective work. So First of all, no government, then no agencies, no third, no third parties, right? So the project would not see governmental help or provide women and families with construction materials. The project sought to engage with different forms of the economy, the creation and maintenance of forms of economic solidarity and forms of organizing that articulate and negotiate values, norms and practices of local economy. Next slide. Of course, everything is not that easy, right? And, and this territorial alternative came with a lot of questions. First of all, from political parties and broader agencies. Political parties saw this as a political ground for offering help, right? So women who wanted to participate in the project left the project because political parties offered a kitchen. So probably in every community, six communities were chosen in every community. The project started to lose members quite rapidly because of external factors. There was also an issue of internal politics. San Dionisio del Mar, the assembly, the famous assembly of San Dionisio del Mar, was controlled by men. Men held the positions of power. One of the conditions of the project is that women have to decide who what well first have to decide who will get the first kitchen and how the materials would be allocated. That created issues between men from the assembly and then the women in the, the reconstruction units. So members were forbidden or from participating in the project because they were challenging these issues. The division and challenges brought by external parties. This project was supposed to take a lot of time, right? And donors, of course, because of pressure from external factors, couldn't afford this long term findings. So, in one community, for instance, they decided to drop materials mm -hmm. in the center of the community, and that created a mess with the list with the order in how the kitchens were going to be reduced. And then there was an issue as well with, with what is a modern kitchen project. Right? Uh, kitchens tend to, tend to be outside in these, in these houses, and architects and then other external actors would come and would say, okay, you want a modern house with a kitchen inside, and this is not how it works, this community, right? Uh, and yeah, just to, can you go to the next one? 
This is an example of, of a traditional kitchen that was being built. And then the next one, the final remarks. The relief efforts are processes that can both encourage and challenge capital regulations. Right? To foster collective processes of resistance in communities that have been affected or that will be affected by the strategies and the change. And how, how is this connected to legal? Through these practices that offer a common and revolting alternatives, revealing solidarity, revealing commons. And I think that despite of the challenges, the project members said as long as we can identify one leadership, then we can reimagine the present and the future of this region. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gerardo. Thanks also for uh, being mindful of the time and sticking perfectly to it. Uh, now uh, let's move into uh, Cristóbal. And I'm going to try to avoid this annoying thing staying here. So let, bear with me while I try to figure out how to do this. Because I really don't like it to be hmm. Maybe if we do it like this, it will go away. I hope, or maybe it won't. Okay, I hope it's not too annoying, but anyway. Uh, so I can you, you can keep this. control of that if you want. Yeah. Can I see that? Or I don't know. So thanks, Gabriela. Hello, everyone. So reducing emission and all emissions by reactivate, reactivate to common sense, the case of lithium. One of the geopolitical effects of the Russian invasion in Ukraine has been the acceleration of different energy independence projects. The European Union is seeking independence from Russian fossil fuel. Countries such as the US are consolid consolidating their position as suppliers of fossil fuels and are also seeking to increase the mining of key materials for renewable technologies such as lithium. In mainstream stories, Lithium embeds the promise that the replacements of existing internal combustion motors with green induction ones powered by lithium ion batteries will partly fix the problem of global warming concerning polluting emissions. In this context, lithium is portrayed as an heroic material needed to achieve innovation, the decarbonization of transport and economic growth. In this presentation, I will think about the growth of lithium extraction in Northern Chile, where the biggest lithium extractive industries are located. I want to show how capitalist modes of thinking and the abstractions mobilized to reduce emissions through green growth projects depending on lithium also generates various omissions, each with its own silence and urgent importance. My understanding of omissions is inspired by the work of the English philosopher Alfred Whitehead, notably his attempts to intensify those dimensions of experiences that are omitted by a mode of abstraction. I'm inspired by his call to generate modes of surveillance over the modes of abstraction, over the dominant ways of thinking that in each era take on a predatory power that can render invisible that which they omit. I want to show how capitalist modes of abstraction may appear certain lithium words while simultaneously omitting and making disappear other words. Capitalist modes of abstraction lashed to the imperative of growth omit how material extraction entails dissipation and decay, ecolo ecological damage and waste. Or to put it in terms of the specific tradition of ecological economics, which inspired this workshop, I want to simply show how irreversible transformations triggered by economic processes are omitted by capitalist modes of abstraction. Indeed, in a more theoretical level, my point is that the revolutionary connector that Nicolas Georgescu Rochian used in the title of his important book, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, published in 1971, is strongly omitted by the capitalist modes of abstraction of those who work within extractive industries. March 28, 2023. Felipe, a metallurgical engineer 
at one of the biggest lithium plants in the world, take us in his van to tour the core of the Atacama Sultan, located in the driest desert of the world. We are in front of the plant's largest lithium pond, which contains the brine that is constantly drawn from the underground aquifer of the Sultan, Salat, and which is made out of lithium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and boron ions. Here, the nucleus of the Salat is transformed into a harvest of salt that precipitate as the brine water, after being pumped, evaporates in the pools. Each of these 16 halate pond measure one kilometer long and 300 meters wide. In this pool, the halate brine chemistry contains 0.2% of lithium, Felipe tells us, adding that this pool was recently harvested. I quote him. When the halate precipitates, the remaining brine is transferred to other pools and the halate salt that precipitated is harvested. And from this pool to the last pool where the brine is taken out in trucks to be taken to the chemical plant, 14 months go by. In 14 months, we will see this pool in the final lithium pool, but this pool will be, will be reduced because it loses mass, both because of the water that evaporates and because of the salts that precipitate. I ask if this mass that comes out can be quantified in relation to the 1600 brine liters that they extract per second. And he says, to have an average number, you have to consider the 80 trucks live every day, that 80, 80 trucks live every day with lithium, 80 trucks of 20 cubic meters each. In other words, if you multiply 80 trucks by 20 cubic meters a day, you get 1600 cubic meters. Then, as he, at his calculator in front of the pond, Felipe begins to make percentage and calculations. I'm amazed to witness how, as we go through the calculations, the landscape disappears, the mountains, the dry air we breathe recedes into the background. How many tons are in this pool? I ask. And Felipe continues doing his calculation to say that there must be like 7,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent here, which take 14 months to arrive there. And that's 7,000 tons for $70,000 a ton. That's like $490,000. I remember that Felipe had told us in the preparatory meeting that all the lithium production is paid for by, by the potassium production. In other words, it's all profit, I add. Remembering that producing a ton of lithium costs about $1,500, similar to the price of a ton of potassium. And Felipe replies, yes, it's the demand. If the demand makes the price go up, then hopefully the Chinese will keep buying more. So no entropy and economic processes, I think, just dollars, profits, and the rematerialization of the global economy in practice, justified by the reduction of emissions project. Within these modes of abstraction mobilized by Felipe, Georgescu Rohin is conspicuous by its absence. Felipe does not see irreversible transformations. He does not see entropy, at least not in this pool. Towards the end of the tour, Felipe takes us to see a tiny scale lithium pond, which he had mentioned in his introduction as the place where we would touch the lithium. <laughs> Showing us the miniature, he provides us with a pair of blue gloves, which we were to conduct a sensory experiment. He explains that the precipitated salt is lithium carnalite or lithium chloride, similar to olive oil, and that it corresponds to the final product that leaves the salpam for the chemical plant to be processed. This brine has a concentration of five or 6% lithium. With our blue gloves on, he asked us to put our hand in the pool while Felipe has a bottle of water in his hand. With our hands in the scaled down pool, he asked us to take the temperature of the water, which is cold. He asked us to keep our hand below the level of the brine while he adds water. And that when that happens, we will feel an exothermic reaction 
all that while the landscape disappears, the mountains, the dry air we breathe, breathe recedes in the background. Felipe proceeds and pours in the water. Did it get hot, he asked. Yes, yes, of course, we reply. And he explains that an exothermic reaction is a reaction that expels heat. And how do you explain that the temperature rises, I ask. And Felipe points out, thermodynamically speaking, the energy reaction generates this heat because it must release energy somewhere in order to generate the formation of lithium hydroxide. There has to be a certain entropy, which is the disorder between the particles in a reaction. And that disorder is perhaps very violent, which generates this exothermic reaction and releases this heat. An endothermic reaction, you need heat to react. Well, I'm actually thinking to myself about the total omission of Georgescu's Rockin's connection between the entropy law and the economic process. Here, a certain amount of entropy is reduced to a miniature pool, and it is not connected to the profit calculations we made in front of the halate pond. Indeed, this mode of abstraction, increasing entropy, appears as separated from the economic process and separated from the impressive amount of water that had to evaporate to concentrate the brine, moved through diesel pumps and plant workers we did not get the chance to meet. Indeed, the modes of abstractions inside the salt plant could be thought of as the entropy law without the economic process, I think to myself. While the landscape disappears, the mountains, the dry air we breathe recedes into the background. I offer these two ethnographic snapshots to think about the modes of abstraction that are mobilized in order to make lithium to appear while simultaneously rendering invisible that which they omit. But which are the omissions produced by this mode of abstractions concerned with emission reduction? Well, this question cannot be answered in general and from London. From London, perhaps, we can realize how some abstractions we might be politically committed with as those proposed by Georgescu Rohim are omitted with lithium extractive industry. But omissions are not the same of abstractions as omissions are locally present. I have witnessed how different collectives moved by different concerns resist the omissions produced by capitalist abstraction. Some of them, for instance, are concerned with the disappearance of deep time, unique microbial ecologies inhabiting salpent key for understanding early events on Earth. Others are concerned with the looming risk of losing a unique archaeological archive present in the highlands of Los Andes. And other collectives are mostly concerned with the availability of water in the driest desert of the world, not only because while water levels go down, biodiversity is reduced, but also because tourists who generate income for the local population could stop coming. There are also people concerned with the ways capitalist abstractions omit the history of extractivism in Northern Chile, more broadly, the impacts of copper mining and its toxicity, not to mention the extremely hard lives of Venezuelan migrants wandering around in Northern Chile. But all these omissions are in tension, in tension with what capitalist modes of abstractions do make appear. Think about money, jobs, and material prosperity in places where the state has been historically absent. Think about local universities, and even about a huge bunch of European and American scholars progressively flying in to study the field, including myself, a researcher, even if I'm Chilean, based within a European university and funded by European research money. Complexities abound. So in abstract terms, and from London, we can imagine how to make disappear growth through normative, top-down, universalist, real politic projects. But when I think about the multiple reasons why different people resist capitalist modes of abstraction, each with its own silence, omission, and urgent importance, the normative and moral authority of attempts to propose global solutions make me feel uncomfortable. It sounds a bit too Euro European to me. So when I think, what I think is important though, is to explore what can we do in order to connect multiple omissions in situated ways through multiple languages and beyond heroes and before promises of salvation. My invitation is therefore to reframe contemporary interest in emissions reduction 
into an ethic of omissions, to think about emissions and omissions simultaneously. But this invitation cannot be normative, neither morally univocal, just because we cannot know in advance what is that which is being omitted and for whom, including the complexities and contradictions of those people living within colonial territories who are simply trying to live a life worth living. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And it's still a very inspiring talk. And I'm just going to switch on the last one. I just la photo de la sea, no el texto como la primera de imagen. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. <laughs> hi. Um, just a minute to introduce myself. Uh, I am Maria Montesino. I am not an anthropologist. I'm a sociologist. My father was an anthropologist. So, uh, and I'm also a, a farmer, an ecological agroecological producer in Spain. I have a livestock of grass-fed uh, cows, uh, a breed called Tudanka that I'm going to show you later because uh, after my neighbors will ask me that, did you, did you show the cows? <laughs> So uh, my relationship with the university and academia is uh, like very peripheric, really, because I don't care too much about papers. <laughs> but I think that papers are also a tool to say uh, different things uh, in the spaces of legitimated knowledge, like LSE here in London. So um, I'm going to read just to put in context the people that uh, yesterday haven't uh, been in the court workshop. And then I'm going to show you uh, basically photos because uh, I think that in two days, uh, speaking about theories in English, <laughs> which is like in a closed space like this, I'm so used to that mountain, so it's a bit hard. And I'm going just to try to summarize uh, what I'm trying to say. And then I'm going to show you like uh, two different um, photographs. The first one are more related to my work as an, a farmer you want to say and the second one are more related to my work as a cultural mediator or as a sociologist that works all the time for 20 years in rural areas very small rural areas in spain very depopulated with uh, elderly women women most times uh, well. so um my research, I've tried to develop like a perspective based on the paradigm of inhabiting the rural. I try to analyze the social construction of ruralities that integrates a plural vision of ruralities. Let's not think like in a monolithic rural uh, area because there are many different and several um, uh, sorts of ruralities. Um, the actors that inhabit it, human and of course non-human, uh, the spaces, natural, cultural, and the ways of relating to each other, eco-dependency, environmental affectivity, power relationships, and also conflict, which is like the in everyday life in rural areas. Um, I highlight these ideas from different theoretical approaches like new rurality, ecofeminism, decoloniality, and political ecology. And uh, one of the basis of my uh, research work is that um, I think that uh, local peasant knowledge and emerging eco-social imaginaries and practices related to agroecological and regenerative food production contribute also to generate resilient models, social, ecological, cultural, and economic, that can be very uh, interesting for the growth practices, not only uh, theories, but also like to uh, start uh, from somewhere. Um, I expose, and I think that this is so important, that uh, participatory processes allow the integration of people with different knowledge and degrees of specialization, and this is so important in rural areas, 
because they are always, we always look at the rural as something uh, subordinated as, you know, like this uh, kind of social construction of they don't know nothing, but even uh, they, themselves, they say like, uh, what I'm going to say to you, you are the expert, I don't know nothing. No? So I try to uh, struggle with this uh, tension. Uh, so uh, we work, well, I work in a, a social, uh, a cultural association uh, called La Ortiga, and we do this kind of uh, workshop and practices with uh, local communities. Um, I think I'm going to show the photos because the text is so boring. Uh, this is the Valle of Campo where I live, high mountains in Cantabria, northern Spain, near Bilbao. Um, it's a beautiful landscape, it snows a lot. Uh, we are not so many people, but I think that we have like so many potentials for anthropology or social science research in these uh, uh, landscapes and villages. Not always like in so crowded uh, towns, but if we look at the micro, we can find so much potential if we talk about the growth. And I think this is very interesting. Uh, this is these are Tudanka cows. Uh, it's like a local breed in Cantabria. Uh, very adapted. Well, um, these are like um, um, I, I was supposed like to talk about food, but I think when we talk about food production, we are really talking about politics, about economics, mm -hmm. about the way we uh, link with the landscapes, <laughs> about the way we treat animals, about the way we care about others' health, and I think to produce uh, a food is one of the most important things to do in life. Sometimes in academic spaces, people is like, oh, you're writing your PhD, you're, oh, that's very uh, difficult, that's very interesting. And I say, well, it's okay, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's, you can meet lovely people like here and it's so good. But I think that what you do um, is so important and it's more important really, because it's the basis of life. We all eat, but we or we, we aren't all anthropologists or experts, but we all have to eat. So bringing back, bringing to the center life and real problems and this uh, materiality basis, I think that is so important. Uh, well, cows, it's not. Um, I would like to <laughs> explain a little bit about the, the commons, because I think that uh, when we talk about um, a communal lands where I live, uh, most part of the land is communal land. And I think that we can uh, make like um, a comparison between the ways we inhabit in communal lands and the ways we could uh, re a relationship or have or connect uh, the way we um, um, live in other, in, other, um, in other activities, like sharing, like with non-profit goals all the time. And I think that uh, if you practice this communalism uh, related to land, you really are also constructing like different imaginaries, not always accumulation, not always this capitalistic way of uh, accumulating. Um, so, um, I think that uh, it's also very important. I think someone in the first round table, a Spanish uh, uh, woman, uh, maybe you, if tú fuiste, uh, that uh, asked about memory. I think that we should have memory uh, also with these uh, kind of spaces in rural areas mm -hmm. because they are disappearing all over the world with new enclosures. And uh, these new enclosures have so much to do with capitalism. And I think we have to, uh, bring that communal land to the center of sharing and with these uh, dynamics of inhabiting as well in non-growth logics. Um, this map is just about uh, the village where I live and um, <clears throat> it shows uh, the part of land that we can um, uh, uh, yeah, to cultivate yeah, each family, uh, just because we live in a village, we have like a part of land and it's uh, absolutely free. And then we have like uh, pastures, meadows and mountains. Oh, well, it's, it's more complex than it looks like, but uh, this is a photo of the uh, communal lands uh, where I live in the mountains. Uh, we also have not only the lands, but also the water and the wood. So we can take wood each winter for our fireplace and it's free and it's, and it's like a, a way of um, a, a, um, 
uh, practice uh, uh, communalism. I read like very simple texts in English, but uh, just to explain the photos. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a uh, agroecological uh, production has to do always, or also with preserving these kind of spaces, these kind of landscapes. And I think that uh, we should all defend this. Uh, doesn't matter if you live there or not, because I think that it has so much to do with climate change and it has so much to do that um, it's like to be mindful about how do we need water, trees, and these kind of uh, spaces and landscapes. Uh, well, this is just for the anthropological part. This is a carnival, a masquerade in the where I live. That is so much. It's so it has so much to do with our relationship with you know animals or a community. It's a space of transgression against religion, against well, like making jokes, like the potential of carnival. That I think, like if we talk about cultural and material heritage, it is so um, uh, fundamental as well, no? Okay. And, uh, well, we also in this cultural association, we also think that uh, publishing is a great idea. So we publish a magazine. is uh, not academic, obviously. Uh, is uh, auto auto funding, self funding, no? Self funding, and it's so nice because everyone can write there or make some photos that put there, and you know, like just to debate. Okay. Um, I would like to talk if I have the time. I don't know. Okay. So <clears throat> about these. Uh, method, uh, participatory methodology, methodologies that we um, are working with in rural areas. And um, I think that this is um, a great, a strong point to bring to the center, uh, the implementation of these methodologies um, to um, uh, give, uh, well, I don't like the sentence, like give voice, but to put in the center some voices that are not usually uh, uh, listened to, no? I'm so much better in Spanish. I can't, it's like frustrating, frustrating, frustrating. So um, it's like a, we work with a, what we call citizen laboratories. We call it rural laboratories, really, not citizen laboratories. But citizen, citizen in this sense just means that everyone can participate. And this uh, is um, a space where a person or a collective proposes to work on a specific problem in the environment, neighborhood, village, area, town, city, and other people can join in to develop it in an open and collaborative way, a place that offers the resources to spend it, blah, 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 blah. Horizontal way, non-hierarchical, we spend all the morning talking about how to put knowledge into action, how to work um, in a multidisciplinary way. Well, we can work that way. I mean, um, I work with artists, with biologists, with archaeologists, and this is so fun. And this is so good for uh, the rural areas as well, because we mix like with farmers and with everybody. And then we really uh, find solutions for people, because people doesn't matter about papers. People matter about their own problems. So if they don't have water in the aquifers or in the fountains, they're going to say, what can you do for me? with your anthropology background. So let's try to do something. Doesn't matter if you fail, let's try to do something. So that's where uh, we work. There are well, lots of uh, topics, culture science in the face of social problems, intangible heritage, well, so and so. Um, the dynamics are so simple and so funny, like the ones that we have uh, this morning. And uh, well, we have just some photos to share, okay. And we also <laughs> work a lot with children, rural children, like trying to make <clears throat> um, uh, games or something, and always with artistic and cultural mediators, so they can facilitate some uh, dynamics, participatory dynamics, uh, to learn about uh, the inhabitants. And well, uh, we we have uh, we are trying to build a community, uh, energetic local community in a very small village, mm -hmm. and we are doing that with the help also of the children, asking questions like try to be uh, creative and don't be afraid of children's answers. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, really great. Mm -hmm. We also. Um, use like these uh, methodologies uh, based on collaborative mapping. Uh, like these ones, it, we work so much with elderly women 
because they are like the main, um, uh, like so important what they, the, the, the knowledge they have to bring us about the growth. It's, this is incredible. I have some photos, well, with artists, I have some photos uh, working with rural women about um, how they use uh, local um, plants to make things uh, like, I don't know, like, uh, well, the text was over there. Yeah, well, like dye or like uh, cook it or use resin to uh, make another like um, in the fireplace. I mean, like using like a multitask use of uh, local plants or uh, is so important. And this is, uh, I think, so I, I mean, it's in Europe, it's in Spain, and we are uh, looking to the other side. And I think this is so important to bring like uh, solutions, possible solutions from the north to the north as well, because we have it in the rural, so many. And well, uh, traditional objects and so on and so da, da, da. This is what I call, because I, um, I do lots of workshops with elderly women. And this is what I call in Spanish, pensar con las manos, which means like thinking with your hands. When we do a collectively, collectively something with our hands, like cooking or baking bread or something like that, everything changes because we are not looking our, the back of our heads. We are looking the back, we, we are not looking the back of our heads like we are now, you are now really. Like we are like, in a circle, talking and walking around, a piece of salt, mm, it tasty. So this changed everything. And this has so much to do with anthropology as well. So, uh, well, this is like traditional. And we also work with academia and universities, of course, the University of the Basque Country is so open-minded for these kind of things. Um, and we work like in groups with end final consumers and the lecturers or professors or teachers and uh, local producers to find solutions to the problems of uh, food production, uh, intensive farming, and all these um, problems related to, to food. And I am finishing. Um, and just to bring uh, a final question is that uh, in the populated rural areas, we have also this problem of extractivism, also in Europe, uh, also with wind turbines that we are struggling. Uh, against this Iberdrola thing and everything like that, because okay, we think that um, eh, energía renovables mm, are very good, but not that way, no extractive, no in an extractivist way, and so and so. And finally, this is my daughter when she was four years old, walking around. And I, well, this is a sentence from Helen C. Sue. It tries, it means like, I think that we have to look and to put, to pay attention, not always to the same things, not always in the same uh, way, but just look to the simple things because li life is so simple, really. And sometimes we are so like in debates, so theoretical, so engaged to that part of anthropology, which is really amazing. But on the other side, we have to work with people. And we have, I think that, well, I, I don't know which, what we should do really, but I think that we, are, uh, we don't have to be afraid of failure, of making mistakes. And I think that we should incorporate this sovereign, sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty of joy and sovereignty of time just to decide in a libertarian way, just to choose the freedom of the libertarian way, not of accumulation. And that's all. Thank you very much. I <laughs> Um, I this is I think this is this is really interesting um, to hear, especially in line of the discussion, the wider discussion we have had. I think you you are all touching directly and indirectly to many of the questions that came up. Like I'm, I was thinking with your presentation, all this distinction of the global north, the global south that we use, and then we know these distinctions are complicated, right? So like, what, what does it mean? Uh, you know, we I, I I always hear this idea of like there are many norths in the south and yeah, south sure. in the north, and I think. Uh, the things we have heard here are very telling uh, about that. Um, and you're all throwing light into different elements of the transition and how 
to some extent, uh, you, you are you are reflecting on how the idea of transition is still very much captured by the idea of endless endless economic growth in different ways, and how conjunctures like emergency or disasters are used to advance certain agendas. Um, yes, yeah, so I already I'm already seeing many many um, interesting lines of, of thought. Before opening the floor, I just wanted to ask. Uh, I, I sent you a question. Um, I sent you a couple of questions in advance for you to reflect, and I just wanted to ask the, the question also to the room um, because there were two things. One, I wanted to ask you because I, I know you 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 are engaging like you 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 are you do engage research and you are interested in in not just speaking to anthropologists but like to to wider public. Uh, what are the the more the more common or the more annoy, the most annoying obstacles that you find when trying to engage with degrowth in the research that you do when you're trying to to speak about transitions or about change uh, in 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 the context of your work and uh, what what happens then and the other question is uh, from what you have done and presented here and what you have heard in the last couple of days what is your future research agenda what are the new questions that maybe are opening today that uh, you think would be interesting uh, to address. So I would like, yeah, to maybe if you can make a comment on that, and then we will take questions from mm -hmm. the floor. I don't know if Gerardo, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, I think that for me, uh, someone working on Renoa Bolena, I think, um, when I present there, hopefully not here, but there's always people who come to me and they ask me, okay, you are telling me a very bad picture about green energy, but okay. have you seen have you compared this mm. classic fossil extraction with mining or with these really dark extractive industries? And their point is that, okay, if we have to choose between these two, probably we will go for green energy because it's, there, there's less impact. So this is when you bring the idea of degrowth right? and where you say, unless we decrease the emissions, we decrease this growth imperative, then probably if you are black, if you are green, if you are an indigenous, then your territory will be chosen for these growth imperative projects. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard conversation to have, especially in more policy-oriented spiritual right? Yeah. That's, that's super interesting. I just want to yeah. say that uh, that's exactly the way I engage with people. I also work with, with energy transitions and with wind farms. and. I always start to say when, when I'm pushed into this comparison, I'm like, but this is a false choice. Yeah, yeah. This is a choice that is based on the uh, supposition that the only way in which we can think about uh, a good future is with endless economic growth. So what if we started with the opposite supposition, right? That about the need of degrowth. And then we can set boundaries. We can, we can talk about what is sufficient. Uh, we can talk about limits. And then we can think about where do we get the energy from and not just like to continue making this uh, economic system grow endlessly without any sense of end, right? So I, I very much resonates with me. Um, you can start. Um, so you said, which is the annoying moment <laughs> that emerged when you try to engage with the growth yeah. in your field? And and I'm not sure I tried to engage with the growth as an abstraction. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my, my points also in, in the paper. Um, so even if I have a project in which we are working also with a case with China and Norway as a case and following lithium mm -hmm. through different processes, extraction is just one of them, but we are also looking at manufacturing of batteries and recycling of batteries and what it means for sustainable mm -hmm. presence. Um, this whole corporate project of uh, the decarbonization of transport. But if I if I think about Chile, I'm from Chile, as you, <laughs> it's very difficult to to even think as a possibility uh, uh, having the growth as a as a public uh, uh, theme in a public debate. And that happened also in the uh, recent uh, attempts to rewrite the neoliberal constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, in which the growth was immediately forbidden mm -hmm. and people trying to push forward that debates um, were punished mm -hmm. uh, in different ways. Um, but this is also a symptom of something bigger, I think, in which uh, you have a link between Margaret Thatcher here and Pinochet, mm -hmm. and Chile was the, 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 the experiment mm -hmm. of 
uh, neoliberal the neoliberalization of, of different and the privatization of, of 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 life i would say <laughs> in different versions of of life so so that uh, also in relation to the colonial legacy of, of Chile as being part of a South American country, but also now with this neoliberal experiment, the 50 years of neoliberal experiment, it's very difficult also to even think out of the idea of growth, because okay. if I can say a, this is a generalization, but people want to grow. Yeah. So, so, so that's also one of my points in the paper is like, uh, many of the people that I, I, I know in, in Atacama uh, have some sort of relation with mining, mm. all copper in the past or in the present, but also with leasing now. Uh, so if you think about the growth from, let's say, what they call like the sacrificial zones, mm -hmm. uh, it, it really doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's where also one of my points in the paper is trying to say, but we really need to come up with new vocabularies. And there, mm -hmm. I think that's also the point in which anthropology and perhaps ethnography, mm -hmm. uh, a plea for ethnography anyway, uh, can, uh, is a practice that can afford the, 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 the emergence of, of, of new vo vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm really much with uh, Valentina, who said yesterday, you know, like something about <laughs> the blue rivers and how the growth as an index of an attempt to 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 to, to, to fight against growth that in my case is against entropy, increasing entropy. The, uh, that project is one of many, mm. I would say. We don't need the, the, the big umbrella and how you engage with the growth. I think mm -hmm. it's one of many. And I think one of the risks is to propose a project as a universal mm -hmm. project that you should as a normative project. So I will stop there um, mm -hmm. because I could, well, but yeah, that's. Let's see if, uh, if maybe the topic comes back again in the questions, but uh, yeah, Maria. Yeah. One of the challenges, just to say one thing, it's uh, um, when I talk not about the growth, but just about ecology, I always have like uh, problems with other farmers from mm. ultra right wing parties mm. that are so conservative uh, that say like, ah, you're ecologist and to be an ecologist is like an um, insult. Mm. Mm. So this is the main problem in words. Yesterday we were talking about translation, not only uh, talking about language, but also talking about the meanings. So this is a great problem in rural areas that when you try to uh, like Mm, talk about ecology mm -hmm. or the growth or it's yeah. it's a problem with mm, the it inhabitants many of them because they don't agree but, uh, yeah and I, I was just thinking that uh, very uh, recently now there was in, in chile there was a recent debate uh, for a law to create uh, protected areas in the south of chile to stop the advancement of salmon farming mm -hmm. and there was all this debate of like oh this is a law that is being pushed by the ngos that are funded by you know the Canadians or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like uh, anti-workers. This is anti you know the people that make their living here. And again, like this idea of saying, oh, you're an ecologist, like you care about the, the fish and the sea more than you care about people. It's also a, a use as an insult. And I, I find that yeah, I mean it's uh, it's, it's terrible, but it's very telling also. Like you know the moral economies that we have yeah, and sure. all these things. But yeah, great thing. Okay, I could also continue, but I would love to uh, take some questions from the floor. We're still uh, we're a bit short in time, so it might take two or three at once before having our speakers answer. So yes, over there, thank you. Um, so, if I understand, you see a direct relationship between emissions and omissions, maybe in technological complexities or, or complex forms. You have uh, more emissions required to produce them, more emissions will probably emit use and consumption, probably waste too. And inversely to lower tech things. Um, so I was thinking of like a bike or just car. So a bike, you've got a factory, you've got you know, obviously wheels that go into production, but then once it's in use, it's a lot less it's requiring some small roads, yes, but compare that to a car, you've got a lot more emissions, a lot more footprint. You probably want to measure it with a kind of footprint or a in the production, use of it, uh, you know, larger infrastructures are required, cars and whatever. I guess I was wondering, I think I understood you had a bit of a resistance to kind of talk about a normative approach to technology, but how would you 
approach, say, like the low tech or what's good for them and what's good. But do you see that relate to your work? Are you doing like introduction stuff? Which I think is really, really fascinating. Like, I love seeing what the flow of this happening with what you actually produce and extract with it. Because it's right, you're, you're, you're bringing it to light because of this huge omission. I guess that's the question. Then. How do you see low, low tech being a good for health? It seems complexification. I'm just going to repeat that question for the because I maybe uh, they cannot hear it in the Zoom. So it's about the relation. Uh, what? How do you? What do you have to say about low tech? Yeah, that's kind of the summary. So I have three more hands. So first, uh, okay, we have Naila, and then over there, and here, and here. Let's keep it brief so then people can answer. So first. Okay. I haven't been here for much of the workshop, but I would like to ask a question. And that is uh, listening to you answer the question that you posed. Do you think there is any kind of geography to the strength of feeling about the people of Magenta? The strength of feeling? The, 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 the support for a people mm. of Magenta. Is there a geography to it? Mm. You mean like if it's uh, in some places more than in others, like if an even well, leader, the objections yeah. that you raise are things that I would consider valid. Mm. You know, mm. so I'm wondering if it's because we know where you're from and I'm where I'm from that maybe we don't mm -hmm. yeah. completely agree on anything. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, over there, yes. Thank you. So thank you for such a great panel. I really, really enjoy uh, the two new presentations because actually I'm working on a project where I'm going to go to Mexico, then to Chile, and then I'm also working from Spain. It's magic. Welcome, welcome. So I'm going to talk about the political impact and the political impact of artificial intelligence, and I'm a computer scientist, so I don't know anything about ethnography, so just like <laughs> join me there. And I have like two questions to be brief. Uh, one is, uh, what is our responsibility as a privileged academic in the in the north, in the so-called global north, doing ethnography in, in the global south and also uh, in rural areas uh, in Europe? And then my second question is, what about resistance? Um, is there any um, difference between like resistance in in Europe and in South America, like in America? Are there like similarities between like how people resist um, these kind of projects? Here and there, and then we wrap up. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. I want to ask a question about the contradiction or the contradicting interest between labor and ecology. Because mm. I do think, like, if there's intellectual work to be done, then it is to find a way to how to articulate that mm. in a meaningful way that mm. could inform political action, right? Because mm. otherwise, if it just stays at that level, it doesn't help. And I was also curious, like, do you see your field work? Like, Places where these two merge, mm -hmm. like occupational health usually is one of the first ones that appear. And agriculture is usually the second one, actually, where mm -hmm. labor and ecology can go in the same direction. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how do you observe it? How do you, and do you try to think about it beyond your work as well as a like a formulated theory? Such a long question for me now. <laughs> the final one and then I, I, I'm lost. <laughs> I was just uh, wondering uh, um, on your presentation, I, lo I, I loved it because uh, you showed uh, that it's not perfect what is produced there. I mean, there are many problems mm -hmm. and we all, always search for projects that are successful. Mm -hmm. let, let, That's true. Know, we, we want to want something that works. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to ask you, um, how how you feel with this? I mean, um, well, how do you think it can contribute to the growth debate? And how can we use? Because I I had I had I had the same in my field work, and I don't know how to how to use it. And the other question, also maybe to everybody, mm. do you think that it's like kind of easier uh, to resist or to spot the resistance, uh, this hot resistance? Because you speak about. Uh, um, a more cold resistance it's like more not so much defined it's it's more just a practice or everyday resistance and stuff and and you speak more about the hot resistance and and like more militant maybe not but also militant so um 
do you think that it's easier to spot the resistance when the, there is a direct uh, outside danger, like mm -hmm. uh, like in, for example, the the renew renewable energy projects or or other or mine projects? Um, and what's the relation? How how can if, if it's easier to spot it or or what's happening? Okay, let's have then like a. Yeah, round of responses. Take uh, you can take one or multiple with total freedom. Don't, don't feel like. Yeah, no. I think that in earlier in the day we were talking about the difference between anthropology of degrowth <laughs> and degrowth anthropology, right? And the tension between the descriptive side, the prescriptive side of degrowth as a political agenda, as in the North is the one that should legal and then the south should be able to explore alternatives right? and then the anthropology of ego as the study of the growth imperative and the different forms that growth takes as it expands basically its tentacles across the south and we were also exploring the issue of studying up and studying out right? the studying up as in conducting ethnography with those who are more powerful but being reciprocal with those who are out and being reciprocal, right? And this talks about positionality as well, of course. I don't think that I will ever publish that unless I have an uh, agreement from the assembly, which have to, has to be unanimous. So you can imagine the challenges that I will invite, and unless I give the lead authorship to one of the members of the assembly, right? And of course, I'm showing this just an example of Territorial and as for the challenges, what are the challenges? Of course, there are two things, right? The, the project members told me this can be messy, but as long as we identify one person who's willing to take this resistance in the future, then the project is successful in spite of all the pressures or the tensions. But I think also this is a great background to explore how, what are the challenges, what are the politics, the, the nuances, of these, of these projects or of these visions that are pushing for recommoning, for rebooting, for conviviality, right? And recounting these politics is already inside. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Uh, Jorge, you have the floor. Yes, want to go next? Okay. Um, geography uh, makes me think about space and and about this idea of no a los polígonos eólicos mm. uh, that was yeah. in you, <laughs> <laughs> it was there. But in Chile, the way that the, the corporative transition names the place where lithium is uh, located in different south pumps in three different trunk in, in three different countries, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, they call it the, the jungle of lithium. So we have polygonos, no to polygonos, uh, in this case, <laughs> no uh, to triangles, no. So, but this this idea of, of polygons, of, I don't know if you say polygons yeah, in polygon. English, polygons and triangles, let me think about an, a particular idea of space okay. as something absolute, no? It's like a Newtonian space in which there is not really like any kind of transformation that is irreversible. Um, so in my particular case, that kind of capitalist geography, what is doing, I think, in terms now of the low technology, but the, the, the industrial uh, innovation in technology, in terms of decarbonization, um, what is doing is more like a decarbonization of locomotion, I would say. So it's more about mechanics. You know? It's about how things move up, uh, on over, upon, some sort of space that can be think can be can be think as a, an absolute space, but when you live there, and and I work with with people there, uh, my partner lives there, Marina Weinberg, she works there and uh, at the uh, at the small anthropology department uh, in northern Chile, and and they have initiatives, but they are not they don't need to to make big statements about that. I am thinking about the Escuela Andina the Andean school. And they work in a different kind of geography because they, they meet the, mm -hmm. the, the people, most many times women, 
that work with their with their animals like it resonates with what with your work you know this outside the prof professionalization of knowledge and uh, the professionalization of care also like it's more they and and recently this week marina sent me a, a short video about a moment in this school and dina showing me a woman who was like in a sort of like educative environment saying the university is here this is the university and i think that's another kind of geography no that's 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 the geography and i think that academic knowledge and i, I that's how I, I relate to your to your presentation is like will not make it right so mm -hmm. So there are these geographies in, in the territories that are omitted <laughs> in, <laughs> by this, all the big projects that are no low tech, but that are industrial techs and ideas of innovation that in order to deal with temporality and the issue of temporality, they really like they, 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 they neglect uh, uh, any kind of past because that's the risk of the urgency that we need to move very very fast because mm. the, the the issues at hand are super super important we need to move mm. and go towards re renewables as fast as possible and i think that's a very problematic problematic uh, normative stance i think and and then i don't know about uh, low tech or movements of low tech within this field but i mean because i think it relates to a particular kind of scholarship or or movements but but there are ways of 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 living that they they do not need. Of course, we, you know, the only electric vehicles in northern Chile are the big trucks mm. that the mining companies are trying to to use as marketing. They recently uh, launched a new, uh, you know, electric truck uh, in Tocopilla, like saying this is the decarbonization of mine. Mm. But I haven't seen any kind of electric uh, car uh, in, in this region at all. I, I have seen migrants uh, walking around without knowing where to go that are also uh, coming from Venezuela. And now we see also Venezuela as being reincorporated by the geopolitics of South America because oil in Venezuela now is very precious. So, mm. but low tech, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I want to. I want to learn more, and I want to ask you uh, when we go for the beers, <laughs> if you can tell me more. About it. And I could continue talking, but I yeah. think yeah, I'll leave continue it there. later. In the yeah. yeah. I don't remember any questions, but I just remember <laughs> one thing that she said about perfection, about no, about uh, that we are like obsessed with uh, perfection when we are. I'm talking about you. That. <laughs> Of a per perfection when we are working in our papers and research, and I just would like to say that um, thought is absolutely uh, uh, life is impure, life smells, life hurts, life is life. So I think that <laughs> we don't have to follow the so modern Occidental way of modeling life. Like we have a model here, and we have to go through this model because it's perfect. And we should or we probably uh, should just try to look at life in a different way. Just what do we have here? Do we have this landscape, these beautiful people? So let's try to do something uh, in a collaborative way. And just sometimes that's why, because I always talk about um, like simple questions sometimes look simple, but they are really great questions in life. And I think that um, I always talk about this metaphor of constellation, constellación uh, de los comunes para los que habláis español, es una web muy guay de una compañera, constellation, just to talk about um, so many little projects all over the world, so many uh, little people, let's say like that, um, trying to uh, just live a quality life, uh, with others and just trying to understand even if we don't speak English very well even just try to push potential our potential as not only humans but also as inhabitants of uh, of the planet so I think this is the real point and I don't really care if we call that the growth if we call that a labor theoretical blah 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 whatever, because life is another completely different thing 
And um, it's so great that we can talk about this in an academic space like this. This is so great that we have also academic tools and papers and people uh, doing research. But I think that we should uh, take uh, like a, a lot of responsibility with real world as well and go beyond uh, papers so many times. And I would like to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're uh, uh, almost there. I just want to say I, I apologize for the people in the Zoom that I have two questions that we won't have time to answer, but we're going to do it in the fashion of our Friday seminar here at the Anthropology Department, which is, I'm going to read it, and then okay. you can think about it, and we, we can discuss it later in the reception, okay. just because they, they are, I think they're quite interesting questions, and we can all reflect on that. So, so Matt French is asking a provocation rather than a question. Mm -hmm. He's saying the credible step for European anthropology departments to engage with degrowth would be to hire researchers from the Global South to undertake ethnographies of consumption practices and environmental worldviews among European members of the global 10%, responsible for the 48% of global emissions. There's a reference there. The demo this demographic cohort would include thereby disqualifying most senior European academics. That is for Tomaya. <laughs> and then, but without the need to come here, so just stay right. there. yeah, that would be not. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, the the would the acres come? Yeah, it's in Latin America. Oh, so yeah. Sorry, well, I didn't hear the question. Uh, the, the, the next question is by Ute Akelkam, and she's asking, uh, I assume this is for uh, Maria. She says, um, Do most farmers in Campo Valley see themselves as part of the degrowth movement? What is its local history? Are there tensions across the region between sustainable and extractive farming traditions? That's okay. an interesting question for you. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We can continue uh, discussion in the reception. Okay. And with that, we conclude our workshop. And uh, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.